But in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, he says, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 4. I'm going to just read these uh, a few scriptures and then we'll, we'll get into our teaching. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And finally, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. He says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now we've been, we've been talking about this. We've gone uh, pretty extensive over this and, and speaking on aggressive faith. Uh, the faith and in the inheritance of the believer I know that we had talked about uh, in, in the weeks past. But he says, I give you power. And, and uh, when the disciples had received the Holy Spirit, as we had been saying, they knew and, and they believed what Jesus had said, that when he said, when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, you shall receive power. Now, I think we've, we've gone over that and, and we've, we've uh, explained that pretty thoroughly, that the power is not to be used on our own purposes, or on our own will, because God's power is only to be used for His glory, for His honor, for His purpose. And, and uh, as I said, a lot of times we as believers, we shy away from talking about power or asking for power because we, we, we have this sense that if I'm asking for power, then I'm not being humble. That, that has nothing to do with asking for the power that Jesus has given us because when he, the spirit comes, he comes in power. And, and so we don't have to worry about the power being there. The disciples knew, and they believed Jesus when he said that you shall receive power. They knew that when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, that the power was there. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth is given unto me. Now, now see, Jesus, and, and this is something just, just to uh, refresh, but this is something that, that we have learned uh, along the way that Jesus in this moment was saying all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now it wasn't given to him as God, obviously, because he was God, but while he was here on the earth, he took on the form of man and he, and, and he didn't assume his own power. And so he said, if I'm going to live on the earth then I'm going to live like every other person and I'm going to depend upon the Father depend upon the Holy Spirit's power. So that power was given to him, and in turn, he gave it to his church. You see, and, and, and as we said, we cannot give what we do not have. And so therefore, Jesus gives the power to the church, and he says, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Now, we see this, and this is why Peter now can look at a man who's lame at the gate beautiful and say, silver and gold I don't have, but such as I have. How did he have it? He was given it on the day of Pentecost because Jesus Christ gave it to him, and he said, rise up and walk. Now, that had never, that, that, that prior to, to Pentecost, Peter had, had, God had, Jesus, when Jesus was here, he had anointed Peter. Peter had experienced the power at times, but that power wasn't a resting power, a staying power until the day of Pentecost. Now on the day of Pentecost, that power came, and Jesus, as he said, he said, when, if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. And so Peter knew that he had the power. It, it wasn't, I don't believe that Peter was walking up and all of a sudden he had this tingle and said, okay, you know. No, he knew and he believed the word of God because that's what Jesus said, they that believe. And he believed what Jesus said and he looked at the man at the gate, knew that the power was there and said, such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ rise up and walk and so we see this and we can, and and the powers continue uh, continuous and we see it throughout 
the book of Acts. Peter says, I have something. I have something because I've received it from God himself. I've received it from Christ. At that moment, he knew that Jesus was seated at the right hand of the Father and that all authority had been, been given in, to, to him. It was at that moment that Peter knew and that the church w- would never be the same again. But see, here's the thing. The church has to once again realize the potential there is in complete dependence upon the Holy Spirit. As, we've, as, as I think we've gone in and we've uh, elaborated on this, that, that uh, in this modern day uh, world that we live in, um, if we're not careful, we can depend on a lot of other things rather than the Holy Spirit. And we can go through the motions and we can go through the religious order of things and we can, and we can establish churches and we can teach in classrooms. We can, we can find talent that will play in a worship team. We can find people that will minister the word of God, but if the spirit of God is not there, there is no power. And the, and the modern church has even come to a place that in the absence of power, she has depended upon a lot of things. And now there's a lot of programs that have taken the place of, of anointed preaching and teaching of the Word of God. We, we never take away from the Word of God because, as we said, the, the Word of God, the Bible says that the gospel is the power of God. Now, I want you to think about this, unto salvation. But the gospel is the power of God. When Paul went out, he, he says it himself... He went out and he preached and he taught the word with the spirit of God and power. That he didn't speak with enticing words, but but in the spirit, in demonstration of the spirit and power. And as we said, it's a shameful thing that so much of the word that is preached today is a word without power. Power. See, the word of God is the power. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That, that, that when, when holy men of God, and here's the thing, this gospel belongs to the Holy Spirit. It doesn't belong to you and me. It belongs to the Holy Spirit. How dare we handle the gospel that belongs to the Holy Spirit apart from the Holy Spirit? You see, the Bible says that every word was inspired by the Spirit of God. Every word was inspired by the the Spirit of God. And and holy men of God wrote as the Spirit came upon them. And so it's the Spirit of God that watched over every word that was penned on, on a piece of paper. Wherever it was put, the Holy Spirit watched over it. It is His gospel. You know, so, so when we come to the gospel, what we need to do is we need to ask the Holy Spirit, help me to understand, help me to know, teach me your word. You see, we have to depend once again upon the Spirit of God to lead us, to teach us, because the Bible says he leads us into all truth. So here's the thing. When holy men of God, and see, and this is, this is a, a thing that we have been, we were talking about even yesterday during prayer. That what has happened in the church is is God has a standard. And the church has lowered the standard. And, and, And it seems like generation after generation, we lower the standard. We lower the standard. We lower the standard. And until finally that thing is so low that anybody can live up to it. And, 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 and it's not about works, it's not about legalism, but God has a standard. See, God didn't come down to, to bring God down to where man is, but Jesus came down so that he could bring us to where God is. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You, and this is a question I asked them yesterday. How many times did Jesus lie? Zero. Jesus never lied. He couldn't lie. He is holy. He is perfect. He is pure. There's, no, there's, there, there's not a lie in him. Satan couldn't tell the truth if his life depended upon it. He'll tell you a lot of truth, but, but I can tell you this. There's a lie in it somewhere because lying is his native tongue. 
Jesus doesn't, doesn't lie. So here's the thing. A lot of us, we, we get, we've come to the place because we've lowered the standard and we've lowered the standard and we've lowered the standard that we don't believe that men can live above sin any longer. Now, when I say that, man, I tell you, you, you begin to speak to a, to a remnant, to a smaller group of people. And I don't, and I don't apologize for that. I, I don't apologize for that. Here's the reason why. If, if, if it was not possible to live in a way that is honoring and pleasing to God, then why would Jesus look at the woman who was caught in adultery and say, go and do what? Just don't sin as much as you used to. Go ahead and sin sometimes, but, 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 but remember. You see, James says, if you sin... You have an advocate with the Father because it should be the exception and not the rule. We have made it the rule rather than the exception. And I don't know how many times I've heard people say, well, you got to sin a little bit every day. Tell that to Wesley. Tell that to the Wesley brothers. Tell that to, to, the Finney, to, to Finney. Tell that to those men who raised, who kept the standard high. But what we've done is we've kept lowering it and kept lowering it to where anybody can, can live up to it. And now we don't know the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. I can tell you this. God still knows the difference. He hasn't changed his standard. Just because we lower it doesn't mean God lowered it in any way. Paul is always talking about this. And so here we are. The gospel belongs to God. So here's the thing. If, if, if the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. See, because we've made it a lot of other things. And, and we've said, you, well, we've got to do this and we've got to do that. And we, no, you have to preach the gospel in power. And that doesn't mean fill a pulpit. I mean, there are some that will fill a pulpit. But that means wherever you are, in your workplaces, you speak a gospel of power. When you witness to somebody, you don't witness to somebody with, with, with uh, unassurance. No, you witness to them in full assurance of the gospel's power that when I'm speaking, I'm sure of what I'm telling you. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And there's an assurance there that when I begin to speak that in the name of Christ and with the power of the Holy Ghost there, here's the thing. People are saved. And, and when Paul went, and, and when we think about this, Paul goes and he preaches a gospel 1,200 miles away in Asia from, from where Jerusalem is, and he has to prove to them that this man that walked the earth in Jerusalem who died a criminal's death was the son of God. And he didn't have a choir. He didn't have a tape ministry. He didn't have, he didn't have a, a social media. He didn't have any of that. But yet somehow he proved to them that this man that was in Jerusalem, how, do you, how can you say that? Because Paul said, in two years, all of Asia has heard the gospel. He said, because I didn't preach to them with enticing words of man's wisdom. Now, now see, we've come to a place where, where enticing words of man's wisdom seems to be the rule of the day, that if I can just put my, use a silver tongue and put words in order and make them sound real pretty and sound really, you know, and if I make myself sound really good, then, then all that is is feeding the ego. It's not changing anybody's life. But Paul said, I didn't come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom. But I came to you in demonstration of the spirit and power, meaning when I preached on salvation, people were being saved. When I preached on deliverance, Paul was saying, people were being delivered. Why? Because the, the gospel is the power of God. When I began to witness, people's, people's lives were changing. When I spoke upon the healing power of Jesus Christ, people were being healed. Why? Because I didn't speak under my own authority, but I spoke under the authority of Jesus Christ. I spoke under the authority of the Holy Spirit. Paul was a man that was subject to the Holy Spirit, and he was under the control of the Holy Spirit. And as we have said over and over again, the only reason that Paul was in authority was because he was under authority. We want to be in authority, but we don't want to be under authority. We don't want to be under anybody's authority. We don't want to be under God's authority. We want to be in, in authority. We want to do it our way, say it our way, and, and, and don't you judge me. 
Now, I, I can tell you this. As a spiritual man, you can look into my life and you can think whatever you want. But if I know where I stand with God, it doesn't matter what men say. But I am to live my life on a hill. I am to be a light and, and not to be put under a bushel. I am to be somebody, as Paul said, that, that all men can look into my life. I am, a, I am an epistle read of every man. And our lives should be. So don't get, don't get all uncomfortable when somebody starts looking at you and, and saying, well, well, well. Now if, now, if it's true, repent. If not, don't worry about it. But see, here's the thing. When we begin to preach and we begin to speak the gospel, then we speak the gospel in power. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Meaning, if, if I'm here, Christ is in control. He says in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 5, this gospel is not preached in word only, but in power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. It shows his absolute dependence upon the Holy Spirit. It shows that he wasn't preaching in his own authority. When he came to the Greeks and the Greeks wanted to be, they, the Greeks wanted to be you know, just, just enticed with, with, with man's wisdom and words and, and wanted to be, Paul, Paul said, I, I refuse to speak that way to them. Not us. We, we, would, we would try to please them and say, well, let me, let me sit in your little circle and let's, let's talk philosophy. Paul said, I, I wouldn't have any of it. I preached the word of God in power. And he says, and to the Jews, they were looking for a sign and I wouldn't have any of it. Why? Because the, the power of God is the gospel preached by the authority of the Holy Spirit. When I speak, I don't speak on my own authority. I don't speak for myself. That's why Paul, when he, he, that, that young girl was following him around, you know, we, we, would have a, we would have issue with that. We might let her follow us around. These men are the men of God. These men preach the truth. These men just, we would have thought, man, this little girl must know something. Paul understood something. She was demon possessed. And he turned around and rebuked her. The spirit came out of her. He didn't, he didn't have, he, it wasn't like, oh, I hope when I pray for her, the spirit's going to come out. No, when he spoke to her, that spirit came out. Why? Because he spoke the word of God with power. Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, unto deliverance, unto healing. The, the word of God. I'm telling you, we need to come back to a place. Romans 15 and 19, uh, 15 and 19 says, Through mighty signs and wonders, by the spirit of God, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. I didn't speak on my own authority, but through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. I didn't preach my own gospel. I can tell you, I've come to the gospel many times. And, and, and if I'm not looking to, to, for it to say what I want it to say, I've been confronted by the gospel. I've been accosted by the gospel. I've been, I've been interrupted and disrupted by the gospel many times when it doesn't agree with me. But you know what in those moments I have to do? I, I have to surrender and submit and say, God, this is your word, not mine. Help me not to make it mean what I want it to mean, but help me to say and speak it the way that you wanted and the way that you purposed. Why do you think Paul and them were hated? Why do you think Peter and them were hated? Why do you think they were killed? This is a gospel of peace. But I can tell you why they were hated. Because they didn't speak according to just to you know, entice men or, or to please men. They went into these places, and, and you think about this, when, 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 when these people worshipped many gods, they didn't go in saying, well, you know, let me tell you, but no, they, they, they went in and said, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What do you mean? You're not going to include my God? No, your, your God is no God at all. And they were hated men, hated women because of it. See, now hell has a field day with... With, when, when it gets Christians fighting on the wrong front, seeing the wrong battle, facing the wrong issues, looking at themselves rather than realizing that we're not fighting a flesh enemy, but our, but our warfare is against uh, principalities and powers and rulers of darkness when we, when we can look at men in flesh, see, see the thing is, is we have to see the sinner and we have to absolutely love the sinner but we have to hate the sin. What does that mean? We have, to, we have to know that they are being controlled. 
He, even in prayer last night, just as, as we were praying, all of a sudden I, I felt impressed to pray against even uh, all of this uh, human trafficking that is going on. And, 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 and as I was praying, we were, I was praying for, for those that were in, you know, uh, being trafficked, but, but all of a sudden it was the Spirit of God gripped my heart and said, pray for those that are doing the trafficking. Why? I love those people too. I hate what they're doing, but I love them. And the reason they're doing it is because they are bound by a power. They are not the enemy. The enemy is controlling them like a puppet. And we need to begin to realize that prayer means something to God. And when we come together in prayer, we bind principalities. We bind authorities. Jesus said, I give you power over all the power of the devil. And those men and women, if they were released from darkness and the, and the blinders were pulled off of their eyes, they would see where they were at and then they would realize, my goodness, what a wretched person I am. They would repent, cry out to God, but somebody needs to speak and preach the gospel to them, but they need to speak it in power and in authority of the, of the Holy Spirit with demonstration of the Spirit's power. We've, we've come to a place where we don't depend upon the power. We don't expect to see the power of God. We, we talk a lot about it, but we don't expect to see it when we begin to talk and preach and, and, and witness to people. That's why we're so afraid when we see somebody that's sick. Well, what if they don't get healed? But what if they do? What if they're not delivered? But what if they are? You're going to let the, the devil, you're going to let that fear come over you? No, as the songwriter said, my faith forbids my fear. Doesn't mean that there's not that sense of fear, but my faith forbids it. It overrides my fear. And it says, you know what? Those people need to be delivered. So you preach it, you pray for them, and you know that God's going to be there. Jesus said it. They'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Not might recover. He said they shall recover. And as I said last night, there's no prideful Christians. I don't care what anybody says. Pride is of the devil. Now the church has allowed things for foolishness like that to come into the church. But that's, God has never allowed that in his church. He kicked Satan out of heaven because of that original sin pride and he won't have it in his ministers. Those people can continue to fool themselves but they'll stand before him one day and he'll say, I never knew you. Not your existence, but I never knew you as being your Lord. See, we come against spiritual wickedness. We come against power. And we'd better get on the right front if we're going to defeat the enemy. If our fight's going to be effective against the enemy. See, we, we, the devil likes to point to a lot of things. He likes to point to politics. He likes to point to, to many other things. But, but that's not our fight. That's not our front. The church has to become what she is supposed to be, a mighty army of God. We have to begin to see ourselves as that. See, God didn't say, I'm going to remove these things. But what Jesus said in Luke 10 and 19 is, I give you power over all the power of the devil. Then he tells Peter, I've given you the keys to the kingdom that whatever you loose shall be loosed and whatever you bind shall be bound. So what, what, whatever on earth. So, so God, God doesn't, as we said, God doesn't look and, and, and many times we're praying, God bind this thing. He's saying, I gave you the power, do it. We are clothed in power. We are robed with authority. And we don't see ourselves like that. When, when, we, when we come to depend upon the Holy Spirit and we are filled with the Holy Spirit, especially those of us that call ourselves Pentecostal, and we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We are robed in authority and power by the Holy Spirit. And this isn't so that we can, we can walk around with our, with our head and up and our nose up acting like we're somebody. No, we, we, we come with assurance. We don't come with, with arrogance. We come with assurance that the power of the Holy Ghost is upon us. When he said, come into my throne room boldly, that means we come in with assurance. Not, 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 not arrogance, but assurance that he told me to come in because I'm his child. He told me to bind that devil. That must mean that that devil can be bound. 
That means that the Spirit of God is upon me. That must mean that that if He said, I've given you the power, then I need to believe that He's given me the power to do it. To bind, to loose, to use the authority that He has been given me. That He has given us. You see, we look at the world and and, and we think that that the enemy, and and, and we cry out, oh man, God, this, this enemy... We look around and we see all the enemy is doing and, and, and a lot of times this is what we do. Man, this world is going to hell in a handbasket and, and Jesus must be coming soon. What he's saying to you and me is get out there and do something about it. Because where sin abounds, the grace of God does much more abound. Now we've made even that another thing. And that's, that's another message all in itself, but we've made that something that it's not. But it's that favor, that that power of God that is on us, that whatever the enemy brings in, no matter what force he brings against us, God will bring bring his spirit in, in, in greater power and authority over anything that the enemy can do. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, Psalm 24 and 1. You see, the thing is, is and, and as we said, when the Bible tells us in Psalms that that God is speaking to, the, to, to his son, and we know that. He says, ask me, and I'll give you the nations. And I'll give you the heathen as your inheritance. We know that he's be, the father's speaking to the son, but he's speaking to us also. And, and here's, here's that authority again. God is saying, ask me, and I'll give it. Ask me, I'll give you the nations. Ask me, and I'll, and I'll release the, 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 those that are bound. I'll give you the heathen as your inheritance, meaning I'll, I'll release the sinners. You see, we see Satan. Satan has them bound. And yet we think that, that somehow we're going to have to negotiate with Satan somehow, some way. God says, ask me and, I'll, and I'll, I'll set him loose. But see, now he's given us the authority through Jesus Christ. And this is, this is, why, this is why it's so important for us in prayer. This is why it's so important because prayer edifies us. Prayer builds us up. Prayer is the one that helps us to, to, to be strengthened. Prayer, prayer increases our faith, if you would. And you see, he, he, he's, saying, he's saying the earth and, and the fullness thereof are mine. And so if the devil, if the devil has somebody behind bars, he's saying, he's saying ask me. And I'll, and I'll give you the keys. And I'll release them. And, but, but there has to be somebody there to receive them. There has to be somebody there with enough authority, enough, enough, uh, enough faith to speak to those things. That's why we pray for these things. That's why we pray for the, for the, for the trafficking that's going on. N- not because we don't think that God can do anything, but because we know that he is and he will release them. Just, that he'll, just as he'll release those who are in darkness. Just as he'll release those that are, that are unsaved in our families. Why do we pray for them? Because we know that God will release them. I can tell you this prayerlessness is, is, is faithless. Is, being, is, be, is having a lack of faith when we don't pray. Because when we don't pray, we really don't believe. Because if we believed, we would pray. Because Jesus said, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. And Jesus is the one said, when you pray, not if. See, the mark of a the mark of the of, of the believer, and, and again, is that the tame the controlled, Psalm 37 and 11, shall inherit the earth. See, the meek, the meek shall inherit the earth. The, the mark of, of those believers are that they are meek, they are tame, they are controlled, they are under authority. They're the ones that are going to disappoint the enemy. They're the ones that are going to, to come before the throne of God, not, on their, not merely on their behalf, but on behalf of others. I can tell you this. This is something that, that's come to my heart. You know, we, we talk about intercessors. Anyone who is a Christian, that's your job. Intercession isn't an option. It isn't optional for Christians. It, every Christian, let me put it that way, is an intercessor. As he was in this world, so are we. 
When we see the power of Jesus Christ, it was always, it was always, he was in a prayer meeting coming from one, going to one. Always. We see him coming out and doing great things, going after he's done, goes right back into a prayer meeting, prays all night, comes out, power of God, used by the power. That's why the disciples, they saw this, they saw this. That's why Peter and them were on their way to the temple when, when they saw the man at the gate. That prayer, was, prayer wasn't optional to them. And they saw the power of God continuously upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says the meek, those, those that have power, and, and this is what meekness is. Meekness is velvet-covered steel, if, I, if, if you would. Best definition I've ever heard. Velvet-covered steel. Power under control. You have the power of the Holy Spirit upon you. But you are, you are meek, you are controlled. That's why he says, if you see somebody overtaken in a fault, you, those of you that, that, are, that are spiritual, restore such a one in the, in, the, in the spirit of meekness. What does that mean, meekness? It means power under control because in your tongue, at that moment, they're at their weakest moment and you have the power to destroy them and finish them off or you have the power to restore them by, by, by coming underneath and, and girding them up in prayer. It's meekness, it's power under control. It's realizing that we have true power. If this was the case and we believed it, we would see multitudes, multitudes stop bowing to false gods. See, if this gospel is hid, the Bible says it is hid to those whom the God of this present world is blinded. Not hid to you and me, but hid to those that the God of this world is blinded. So Jesus says, I give, therefore, we should be able to say, I have. We see that again, over and over. Now, I, I want to get into, because I don't want to get into other things, but Acts chapter 12. And I want you to go there, Acts chapter 12. But we see this, prayers, prayer is, is absolutely necessary. It breaks, it breaks the enemy's stronghold. It's the thing that saved Daniel, as we've discussed already. It's the thing that Daniel, Daniel refused to give up. In Acts chapter 12, and I want to read a little bit. So, Starting with verse 1, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four, the four quatrains of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring, for, bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison. And then the next phrase is powerful and beautiful. You see, Peter was taken into prison. Their, their, their pastor, the head of the church, was taken into prison. Somebody had already lost their life. But see, see, they understood something because, because the disciples taught them early on when, 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 when after the day of Pentecost and, and they had realized that they needed to be in prayer and the word of God, they said, let us find seven men full of the Holy Spirit so that they can tend to the people so that we can give ourselves to what? The word of God and prayer. See, they were a praying people. Pentecost came on, on the eve of prayer. Pentecost came because men and women understood the power of prayer. They were waiting in, 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 in prayer. So the, so the Bible says that when Peter was taken into prison and they knew that Herod wanted to kill him also, and it was well known to them. And so the Bible says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but... Now, now I want you to hear what he says. But... Prayer was made for about 15 minutes. Because after 15 minutes, if God isn't going to do it, he ain't going to do it anyway, right? That's the way most of us pray. Because, because I, I mean, okay, well, well, we'll pray about it a little bit today, and then, and, then, and then we'll pray a little bit about it tomorrow, and, and, and I'll mention it in prayer at some point, and, and we tell people, you know what, I'll be praying for you. 
Brother Mike McGee was here and, 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 he, and he called me one day and he said, I'm starting my 40 day journey. I said, I will. I said, I, I covenant with you to pray for you and intercede with you for what God is going to do with you because he was making a tour around the United States. And I said, I covenant in prayer with you to intercede with you. And you let me know if there's anything else that you need prayer for specifically. You see, the Bible says, the Bible says that they, they did what? They did what? But prayer was made without ceasing of the church of God for him. Now, why would they pray like that? The only reason you pray without ceasing is because you believe in prayer and you believe what Jesus said about it. You believe that prayer makes a difference. You believe that prayer changes anything and everything. Or else you don't do it at all. When somebody says, well, I'll, I'll pray and uses it as an excuse. My goodness, those words will come up against you in judgment. Well, let me pray about it, sister. Let me pray about it, brother. If you don't mean it, you better not say it. The Bible says they prayed without ceasing. Prayers were made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, came, uh, came upon him and a light shined in the prison and he smote Peter on the side, raising him up. Arise, up quickly. And his chains fell off of his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird, thy, gird thyself, and bind thy sandals. And, and, and so he did. And, and he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leads unto the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and passed on through, uh, on, uh, through one street, and for, forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. Now I want you to think about this. Peter is bound in chains. Soldiers on each side, soldiers at the door. The place is on lockdown because Herod is serious about killing Peter too. And so the, all of a sudden, the Spirit of God comes upon Peter. And an angel appears beside him and just says, hey, get up. Let's go. Peter's, he doesn't even believe it himself. He, he, he thinks, I, I'm having a dream. Until he comes outside of those gates and then all of a sudden he realizes he's out there and he comes to himself. It was almost like he had to pinch himself. Is this really happening? Am I, am I already dead? I, I bet that even went through his mind. Am I already dead? Am I in the spirit as he's walking through the gates and as he's walking by all of these people? Am I already dead? You see, the power of God. I want you to see this because here is an angelic being lead, leading him out of the prison, leading the captive, that, that person which was captive. He's, he's setting him free. He takes him to the gates of the city. Now, these gates weren't just any gates. The Bible says that Solomon picked, I mean, Samuel, or Samson picked up the gates of the city and he put them on top of the hill and the gates weighed over 2,000 pounds. And all of a sudden, on, one, on their own accord, they just... Peter, Peter's not even understanding all this. He's still groggy, still waking up. How could the man even sleep in the first place? He's about to die. I want you to see it, though. Verse 12, and when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together Praying. Now I want you to think about this. Think about this. Think about it. Verse 12, read it again because you, 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 you missed it, I'm sure. 
And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. You see, Mark, hey, could, it, could, it have been, could it have been the mother of James and John who James was just murdered? And now she, instead of, instead of having time to mourn, the church began to pray. They'd begun to pray. They began to pray. Pray for who? Pray for Peter so that he wouldn't meet the same men. They began to pray for their pastor. Listen, listen what it says. And Peter knocked on the door of the gate and a damsel came and hearkened, uh, named Rhoda. And when they knew Peter's voice, she, had, she, she, she opened not the gate, for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood outside the gate and they said to her, you're mad. But she consistently affirmed that it was even so. Then, then said they, it is, an, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door, they saw him and were astonished. But he, but he beckoned unto them with the hand with, with a hand to hold their peace and declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James and the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now I want you to think about this. The church had prayed. The church doesn't pray anymore. Oh, I, I, you know, we, we, we see the problems and we think that they're economical. We think that, we think that, oh man, well, let's just elect the right officials in there. Now, I'm not saying that the Bible tells us when godly men rule, then the nation is blessed. But here's the thing. When the church ceases to pray, the church is powerless. And so she prayed. She prayed. Why? Because she believed that when she prayed, that their pastor would be set free. And so they said, they had set themselves to prayer, and basically this is what they said. We refuse to leave until we get an answer, until he shows up, or until we know that his head is off. And we're not going to stop praying until we see. No, we pray 30 minutes, we pray 30 minutes, we think that, man, we are holy, righteous, called of God, and we think that, man, we've done our duty. These people, be, they began to pray and they prayed continuous. I remember when the church used to do something like that. I remember when they would put up a calendar or put up a little timesheet and they'd say, who's going to pray from 1, 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock or 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock? Who's going to pray from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock? And who's going to fill this hour? And, 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 and can somebody fill this half hour? We got a slot here. And they would fill that thing up and those people would commit to praying and the church would pray continuously around the clock and they wouldn't stop until somebody else took up the baton and began to pray. And it was almost like a prayer marathon and they weren't going to stop until they got an answer but now you call a prayer meeting and nobody shows up my God help us why she doesn't believe in prayer anymore oh and then as she does pray a little bit and feels good and she gets a little tingle and, the, and it's not and, and, and I was telling my wife this I said, I said you know most of the church they come into a worship service and they, they get all emotional they clap and they shout and they dance and, and, and then they'll, they'll, they'll feel a little bit of an emotion or something and they think that the power of God showed up no you just had a chemical reaction you didn't, you, nothing showed up nothing happened it wasn't the power of God and see, we've, we've mistaken a lot of things for the power of God. But these people, they were serious people. I can guarantee you some of them were weeping. I can guarantee you some of them were crying. And they knew their pastor was in trouble and they weren't going to stop praying until, they, until, until God did something on their behalf. See, it wasn't one of those 15-minute prayers God, if you don't answer me by Friday, I can tell you this, Friday will come and go, and if you don't continue to pray, you'll never get an answer. See, when Peter arrived at that, at that prayer meeting, they were surprised. 
But I can tell you, it was probably they, they were more surprised at how quickly it had happened. But see, holy men and women of God got on their knees and began to pray. See, the church had set their faith, and, and I want you to hear this. The church had set their faith against the powers of hell. What is, this, what is Satan's great, greatest antagonism? A praying church. What is his greatest fear? A praying church. And we're not talking about a church that just shows up to pray and go through the rituals and, and opens their little prayer books. And we're talking about a church who prays in the spirit. A church who, is, who prays and, and prays under the authority and the power of God. See, they, they refused to accept the inevitable. So they prayed. They prayed that God, that God would do something. And so, so I want you to think about this. God sends an angel. All of a sudden, an angel comes out of eternity and steps into time and and, and, and pulls Peter out of a prison somewhere. Why? Because somebody had enough faith to pray. Are we afraid to pray? Why, why would we be? No, we think prayer is a waste of time. We think prayer, of a lot of things about prayer, but we don't believe in prayer. And, and I say that with absolute confidence. Why? Because if we did believe it, we would do more of it. So the angel told Peter, get up, bind your sandals, gird yourself, chains fall off, all of it. Thing is, is the devil had been able to gain victory. But because the church prayed, God began to move. Think about the outcome. Had the church mourned, whined, fussed, cried, Oh, poor Peter. I can't believe this is happening. God, how could you let this happen to us? Boo-hoo, poor me, poor us. Where are we going to find another pastor? Maybe some churches wish their pastor. God help me. But imagine how the, the outcome would have been if that one little part was taken out of the scripture. And the church prayed continually. Imagine had they not prayed. Maybe another gospel in that, in that maybe, maybe chapter 12 would have been written a little bit different. And Peter was beheaded. And the enemy got the foothold. But it wasn't. And see, and I have to believe the word of God, not part of it, but I believe the whole word of God. And so when the Bible tells me that the glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former house, that God is going to move in a mighty and a powerful day, way in the last days, the only way that's going to happen, and there's no other way, it'll be because she's a praying church and she's returned to the altar again. No other way. No other way. She will once again believe that her words are heard on high. And she will once again enter into relationship with her, with her heavenly father. And God will move and there will be an anointing upon her and the spirit will once again come upon his church in power. And in demonstration, signs, wonders, miracles, and everything else, if we let them. Father, we thank you tonight. But tonight, Father, we pray that God, that maybe there's not an interest. Maybe there's a part of us, God, that wants to believe, but doesn't. But I pray, Holy Spirit, tonight that you would deal with each and every person in this place. Those that would listen, those that would hear or watch even this broadcast, God, I pray. That, Father, that we would, we would not waste our time or yours, but God, we would be the people that you desire. 
that we would be a holy people, that we would live up, Father, to what you, Father, have called us into by your strength, by your power, through the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God who has made us righteous. May, Father, we raise the standard again, Father, and live in a way that is honoring and pleasing to you at all times for the glory and the honor of your name that others may see, Father, what you are doing in our lives, God, and be forever changed in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God.